How do you like to learn? How do you like to be taught? Does that maybe have a connection to the way you were raised and how you like to be with other people? Let's talk about how learning and learning and teaching styles are influenced by the culture in which we operate, in which we live and engage. So there's not just one way of acquiring new knowledge. Let's find out what the best way might be now. Hello, everybody. Two Chaps, Many Cultures, episode 188, the number one show on the internet where we talk about the business of culture and the culture of business. Yes. How are you doing, mate? You went rather German on it. What, what's up with that? <laughs> well, sometimes I fall into the German accent because I feel like I have to drill it in harder. Ah. You have something to tell, and you're going to tell us, and this is you you need to see teach evidence. you about this. <laughs> yes, yes, we have ways to teach you. I understand. I understand. Doesn't work for me. Sorry. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> Don't you accept my authority, my superiority in terms of knowledge? You should accept it from me. Please, dude, get over yourself. <laughs> All right. All right. Good. Well, this is a great, fascinating topic, and this is why we're, we're kind of building on yesterday's, uh, building a little bit on yesterday's in kind of reference and segueing into this uh, to go a little bit deeper and and think about when you are, actually do have people in your in your cap in your zone, right? You've got them captured. You you know you've got a you, you're teaching them, them. you you corral them. You've uh, you've got them there. Them. Close the doors. Absolutely. You've established, they've told you what they want to learn, but now you're going to teach them. And uh, and this is a relevant thing. And I think this was, I always tell a story about this fascinating thing because culture is obviously, we talk about this um, driven by the nurture and nature aspects of culture when you're growing up and, uh, and how your upbringing forms the way you might learn. And, and I always tell this experience about with my daughter and uh, coming home, proudly being presented with a sheet that she is going to be judged on on the presentation and um and 20 percent of the the teacher it's it put on this form 20 percent of the of the um mark will go towards the confidence and the way that they present themselves and the volume of their voice and the way that they conduct and interact with people and with even with direct um you know eyesight and and I kind of then you know reached out to the teacher and said, well, you know, understanding that this is a very diverse kind of uh, student body, just be concerned, be, be cognizant that possibly you're working with students where they're not they're not really brought up to use that confidence or display their confidence when they're so, so teaching. one fifth one fifth of the of the grade was based on delivery confidence posture. That's right. Okay. So you can see that uh, that you know uh, even the smartest person in the room, if they're not confident from a cultural point of view, if they're not they're, sorry, if they're not, then they're, they're not being predisposed or being encouraged to show that confidence. They're being more kind of like low key and low volume, and perhaps not looking at people in the eye. Then perhaps they might get a more negative mark than somebody who doesn't. You know, and I'm using this in in a kid's terms, but somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about, but perhaps boldly says it anyway, right? Um, and so it's an interesting, even though it's only twenty, it's only twenty percent of the mark, but that can go a long way. So being cognizant, a significant portion. So this it is was a school in the US, yeah. right? It's this a school, school. Yeah, it's our, it's my daughter's school. So it was just a, a, a for me, it was not telling the teacher what to do. I could never be, you know, to that standard. But I'm just saying. Just understand, be cognizant of that and maybe keep that in mind that even though 20% of the mark, just understanding that a, a, a child from a certain culture may not have been encouraged to present themselves in that way, 
but they still have the wonderful knowledge. Yeah. In your upbringing, in the school that you went to in Australia, was the confidence level part of the grade? Was that part of your mm. your learning and teaching that you experienced? I don't remember it being that way. No, not explicitly. But we were always. It was always very interactive. Right. So it kind of it lent yeah. itself to the confidence of. You know, no, really, you were encouraged to put your ideas out there, and it was um, it was a, it was a more collaborative, open source type of environment. That's my memory yes. of it, anyway. Yeah. Okay. See, when you talk about these twenty percent, the one fifth of the grade, I was immediately going back to my memory of high school and presenting in front of a classroom, and maybe the confidence level would have been part of the grade that I received, but it was never mentioned by the teacher that this would be a part of his assessment or her assessment. So the the boldly saying it and maybe saying it incorrectly would not give you credit with a German teacher, right? So mm -hmm. factual accuracy would be more important than delivery, right? Um, I only learned this, the, the delivery portion, when I became a, an exchange student and going to high school in the United States. And the first thing I noticed, this, this, I mean, I could have been prepared for this. I could have known this because I watched movies and TV shows in Germany as a teenager where you would see U.S. classrooms. You would see the high school movies and, and TV shows that depict U.S. high school life. And I, I should have known this, but I was still taking, taken by surprise or it still um, changed my perception of classroom experience when I came from Germany to the U.S., in Germany, in the classroom, you sit, you share tables with other students. The way I was brought up in my, the years when I went to school, we were either two people or four people at a big table, and we would sit basically in these mini clusters in the classroom. So there was a group within the bigger, or many little groups within the bigger group. And then I came to the U.S. and I sit in this single chair where the table in front of me folds up and down in this 90-degree angle. So I lift the table to get in and out of the chair. And I sit by myself, with myself, and there's nobody sharing my immediate learning space with me. So that was a, a quick lesson in U.S. individualism for me right then and there. Right. You're all on your own, pal. <laughs> You're on your own, and you better make the best of it. Um, and you better better make sure that your greasy wheel, uh, your squeaky wheel, because you won't get the grease until you're squeaky. Um, so I think that's that's one my personal experience of how culture informs how we learn and how we are taught. Because you said it was interactive in Australia. You imagine or you remember it to being somewhat lively. Again, that's not my memory. My memory is that of a teacher in front of the room more lecturing to the group rather than creating interaction. This may be different now in today's Germany, but when I went to school in the 1970s and 80s, it was still there's one too many. There's one person in the front of the room and 25, 30 people in the class, and you only spoke when you were prompted to. Or when the teacher asked a question that, okay, now I want to see hands go up and I pick, I call upon one of you and you speak one at a time. Then I come to the S and it's a free for all and, and students just interrupt the teacher and it's multiple, multiple people speaking or shouting an answer at the same time. And I was like, holy crap, how is this possible? How, how does the teacher allow this to happen? How, how do you guys dare to speak up like this? So as, as, a, as a teenager, I was completely unprepared for this different way of interacting between the student and the teacher, right? Mm. So I think culture plays a really important role in how we deliver knowledge, how we, how we share new skills and how we share information and make it, how we facilitate the sinking in into the learner's mind, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so it's vitally important, just as we discovered yesterday, that establishing what the perception or what the openness or the process most 
people like to learn through is important in preparing for any workshop, especially when it's a, a diverse group of people. You know, so that that's just uh, fundamental, and and because it is um, and then being able to identify that or being armed with that information ahead of time is so fundamental to your success. It can make or break a workshop. It can make or break a training activity. It can make or break any any interaction that you have to build credibility with an audience. Um, and uh, and and so and call it, maybe calling it out, maybe actually calling it out is. I'm not calling it out, but explicitly. Calling sorry, calling, calling it, in, it in. Calling it in, but explicitly making that a part of the preparate the first part of any workshop you do. I think it's kind of made it clear for me in the last uh, few weeks where I've been going through this um, course is that really need you really need to kind of build this in and and uh, affirm it for everybody to say that I want to be, yeah, I want to serve you in the best way I possibly can. So culturally, and, and then you can use that as an example because this takes away the person, the the, the personal um, aspect of it. You, you're not being threatening to a person and, and saying your way is not the right way. This is the way you should learn. Therefore, I'm going to teach it in this way. Um, it is that you obviously come with your own influences from your background and your your culture and i want to be able to teach to that style now this then it is incumbent upon us as facilitators to be able to build the skills to serve those people in those different ways unless we just want to be very siloed and only uh, only uh, serve a certain part of the population which of mm -hmm. course goes against what we really practice anyway yeah so how have you adjusted your workshop delivery when you when you work with groups uh, how have you called it out or how have you addressed it um, when you recognize that there are members from different parts of the world in your in your group how did you adjust to the different styles well i think by doing that and i don't actually i think i've actually done not a very good job of it in the past but i i it's really now i would say and and i would encourage anybody that's watching this to say you know give us some advice on this but I'd, now i would say it really is an affirming thing to embrace the idea that culture is the the the, the grease okay you use that analogy that we all kind of operate through and so if you've got a diverse group of people you you actually use that as an advantage you say mm -hmm. if you're comfortable if this is something you're comfortable with, can we do an, an experiment or a demonstration where I can show the rest of the people in the room that from your cultural lens, you like to learn and you like to express yourself in this particular way? And, and I've done it uh, in, in one particular case. I did it kind of intuitively because I thought it might. And I obviously got permission of the person to do it. In this case, a young Chinese professional. Um, And it and it did make her very uncomfortable, but she did say afterwards she said it was a lot of fun, but it but it was a very good demonstration, and it kind of came out. It could have gone wrong, I think. When I look back at it, I think, wow, that could have really gone off the rails. <laughs> but it was it, it it yeah. So, but it was a it was a bold thing that I kind of and I I she trusted me and I trusted her, but it was very insightful for the rest of the group because they were obviously. With the with the Chinese um, cohort, they knew that now. Oh, so really, when I'm interacting with my Chinese colleagues, um, I shouldn't use my particular style, or maybe I should adapt my style to a certain degree, right. and that will actually make for a better interaction and a better collaboration. Yeah. And so, it was a great demonstration. But I don't know whether I'd be able to recreate it unless I really intentionally made a process. I don't want to do it on the fly next time, put it that way. Yeah, I think getting the person's permission is one one good prerequisite for this. What what I've done on the fly, so to say, is when I recognize that there are people from uh, different corners of the world in the room, I called it into the group and said, hey, so I would expect you to participate actively. and." I'm not sure if 
that let's say there's an Asian participant or a participant from an Asian country and said, would that be acceptable for you? Would you be willing to partake in this or would you feel like this is not your time and your place to, to make yourself heard and known? So I, I would address it that way in a, in a more questioning style and give them an opportunity to say yes or no. I, I had once, I did a training in, in Germany a couple of years ago during Ramadan, we're right now in the month of Ramadan, and we had the training in the month of Ramadan. It was a bloody hot summer day with window paneling on one side of the room. It was warm. There's air conditioning was fighting the room temperature unsuccessfully so. And there were snacks out, and there was water out, and there was – we went around the room, did the introductory round, and the one gentleman was from – I don't remember Syria, Jordan, from from a predominantly Muslim country, and I asked him, "Are you observing any form of faith?" And he said, "Yes, I am a Muslim." And I said, "Well, are you then observing or following the the Ramadan traditions?" He said, "Yes, I do." So, so what does that mean for us during this training program? Do you need more breaks? Should we remove the snacks? How can I help you be present? and not be led into food and drink temptation or, or how do we not make this harder for you? And it was interesting because A, it felt like the program participant was very happy to, to see that level of inclusivity in the room. And also it was interesting that more than half of the room had no idea that their colleague was observing Ramadan tradition. They would have never thought to ask this question, mm. right? So I think it behooves us as facilitators to do our homework on what type of learning styles, presentation styles, teaching styles might be, might be appropriate for the room that we're working with. I think in my case, uh, what I would change is I would probably wouldn't ask for that permission publicly, <laughs> uh, which I kind of put that young lady on the spot when I, I said, you know, I want to ask you permission. But even that can expose a sense that, you know, perhaps there is um, a tendency for them just not to say no, because at the moment I'm the facilitator and I'm in charge, of, you know, effectively of the room. So whether... You know, maybe she was just ob felt obligated to say yes, whether she felt, yeah, you know, yes was the right answer anyway. Um, so I think I may have just reflecting on that. I probably could have done a better job of observing the room because obviously whenever we go to a facilitation, we would hope you've got the opportunity to kind of network and interact with the participants for at least like 30 minutes or so before any, um, any interaction. And yep. then to Possibly just do the rounds, just get a sense of the people that you're working with. You can see, uh, observe different styles as you do that. And um, and then if that, then I think that if in that case, I would have maybe pulled her aside privately and said, look, I've, I've got this idea and I would really be honoured if you would help me. You know, use these terms. I would be honoured if you could help me in do the, doing this to help your colleagues learn and that kind of thing. So... You know, um, all this is kind of, again, doing doing it on the fly a little bit, but it would have been more affirming, I think, to take that into a private space, whereas I could probably be more comfortable calling, you know, say somebody from a more Western uh, framework where they're encouraged and it's okay, you know, looking silly, you know, um, in those contexts is not really something that's uncomfortable for them. They're willing to go along with the joke um, that, that I possibly tend to deploy anyway. And so that 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 is just affirming the learning styles, understanding that um, the way you deliver information, whether it be through bullet points, whether it be through interactive kind of workshopping and project type of learning, um, it, 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 if you kind of get a combination of both, all of that, um, then you can kind of use that as a learning tool in and of itself, right? Yeah. Maybe a small group, you can say, who in the group did you see was participating in this particular exercise? But maybe they didn't in that exercise, but they did in another exercise where it was more directive and, you know, so. Yeah. And then this is where, where 
a cultural assessment might be quite helpful as as a even as a grounding tool for those of you who are delivering a program to a multicultural audience. If you if you can get a gauge on what um, what your program participants how they rank in terms of hierarchy or egalitarianism, that will give you, for instance, an indicator of how much authority will be expected of you as the facilitator, how 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 lecturing or how precipitory are you entering the room, depending on hierarchy or egalitarianism level, um, direct or indirect communication, how direct can you be or how how more quote unquote diplomatic will you have to be in, in delivering information? The dimensional comparisons that you can glean from an assessment like this will help you prepare to be a more in tune facilitator and teacher, right? So if, if that's possible before you enter the room, great. Sometimes you don't have that luxury. Sometimes you're thrown into a room not knowing who your audience is. So the wider your your bandwidth, your delivery bandwidth is, the, the better you'll be able to serve your audience, right? Mm, yeah, and asking, I think it was a great exercise that someone mentioned yesterday and I kind of guess, and it, and it made me recall one of our previous guests, uh, Jabba Toth, you know, who has kind of identified that we we we're, we want to kind of think outside, maybe a wider spectrum outside of the general cultural dimensions, and and it's an exercise where people just say it's called I, I am, but it's basically going around the room and having everybody, you you're prompted, you're prompting them, and you say, tell me who you are. And they say, well, I am. And they th do things like, I am an engineer. I am a male. I am a I'm, I'm a musician. I am a father. I am a, you know, I'm a son. You know, the, you get into that once you kind of, you, you, you do it like 30 times or so until you establish then pretty much, even in a diverse, very, very diverse room, isn't it, isn't it kind of um, pretty high chance that, Everybody in the room will share some commonality with that person, right? That they will share. They will be a father. They may not be a musician, but they might be also a son, you know. And so it's this great kind of exercise where people are, are giving of themselves and, and you can really glean, as you say, if you're ever kind of in the situation where you're called to do it on the spec and you don't yep. have that ability to prepare, that yep. that's a good exercise to have people kind of think and reflect on just exactly who they are and what their style is and 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 what their upbringing is you know and yeah so i thought that was a great i think i'm going to use that one it's a good one i want to explore it more <laughs> i'll steal that i'll st you know this is all about stealing ideas no, no, you're, you're appropriating it i'm in appropriate a, in a yes. I mean, way. interpreting interpreting yes yes <laughs> well we'd love to hear from you what have been your um, learnings, so to say, what have been your experiences of teaching or studying in different cultural contexts? How have you um, how have you learned well in the past? What didn't work for you as much? Um, how have what, what has been your best teacher? How did they impart new information knowledge? upon you and what methods did they use where we'd like to hear from you leave a comment send us an email ping us give us smoke signals you might even call us with a phone either way do it we'd love to hear from you because we like to learn as well because we're it's an ongoing process um if we don't learn we don't grow. If we don't grow, we die. That's the course of nature. So um, without without learning and building upon what we already know, there will be entropy and we'll, we'll fall apart. So um, with that being said, I expect you to get in touch with us so we can learn better. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thanks, guys. Sorry, Another I episode. Had, I had to get back to this. I have to get back to it. Couldn't help yourself. Absolutely. Tomorrow we have a wonderful guest, by the way. We have a very important guest. Please, you have to join this. Episode 189, it will be with a wonderful guest um, that we guarantee will you will just sit in awe. It's yeah, not that not to overbuild the guy, but I mean, you know, he's pretty you might he's like a cool him. dude. 
a cool he dude. Really I, like fun. Unlike us. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Two Chaps, Many Cultures, the number one show on the business of culture and the cultural business. We are out. We will see you tomorrow. Bye, Dan.